right, hello everyone. It's Mayor Jane again. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on our Wednesday Facebook Live. I know there are a lot of things that you could be doing right now, so we appreciate uh, your attention. We have an incredible program for you today, um, just like every other week, but this one's even better with uh, uh, many very powerful Hispanic women on here. This is Hispanic uh, Heritage Month. We are celebrating which is officially September 15th to October 15th. But here in Tampa, we celebrate every single day. We celebrate our diversity. And so we're very, very excited to have each and every one of you here. So if you uh, just hold on for a few seconds, I'm gonna give some COVID updates and then we'll get right to uh, talking to each of you about, about uh, what you do from day to day. All right, our case update for Hillsborough County, we have uh, 41,178 cases to date in Hillsborough County, and that includes 614 deaths. I know I say it every week, but um, each of those numbers represent a human being, represent a life that has been lost, someone's loved one, a friend and neighbor. And so we are working collectively as a city, not just um, you know, with the city administration, the medical uh, field, everyone's come together, emergency management, all of our residents, everyone doing everything that we can to reduce the number of cases of COVID-19 and therefore reduce uh, the associated deaths. So critically important. As you know, we've opened up our schools. We have not seen a dramatic increase in uh, COVID cases in the Hillsborough County school system, which is wonderful. We have seen an uptick in uh, the college students. Basically, they put them in the categories ages 15 to 19. There is a spike, but um, most of those, according to the uh, health department, are the college age up at 18 and 19 years old. We did, uh, the governor allowed the bars to open up again. And um, while I know that uh, bars make up uh, a large number of our successful small businesses in the city of Tampa, and I understand that everybody's going through difficult times, I think that opening the bars is a mistake. We saw a huge spike when they were opened a couple of months ago and had to close down. It took us about four months to level those cases back out. And so we'll see what happens uh, this time. We have law enforcement checking on all the bars every evening to ensure that uh, they are following the rules of wearing masks and everyone sitting and six foot distance separation when possible. But uh, anyway, we're working, doing everything that we can to help out our small businesses. Uh, the CARES funding that the county uh, received is available for our small and large businesses. So please visit uh, Hillsborough County's website and see how you can apply for those relief programs. Very important. Uh, we are still have our program lift up local. And now that we are going through this dramatic cold front where we are down in the mid seventies, some mornings, I mean, we're all breaking out our coats on that one, but uh, we're gonna look to opening up going back to uh, the parklets and blocking off some of the streets and those kind of things so that we can um, we can allow our restaurants and retail to serve more customers in a very, very safe manner. So very excited. We're continuing forward with uh, planning for the Super Bowl. It will look different, but uh, we're gonna have that. And as I have stated all along, we're gonna be the first city uh, in the nation that not only wins the Super Bowl trophy in our own backyard, but at the same time, we're gonna win the Stanley Cup, go Bolts, and we're gonna win the World Series. So we have some exciting things going on around here. There's no doubt about that. So again, working very hard um, to reduce the number of, of COVID-19 uh, cases and get back up on our feet uh, economically here in our community. We are blessed to live in Tampa, to live in the Tampa Bay area, greatest place in the nation. But um, individuals, despite what's going on in the world today, um, businesses, organizations, families still want to move to the Tampa Bay area. So we are blessed uh, in, that, in that fashion. Any information that you need, it's on our website. So go to tampagov.net 
Anything you need to know about COVID-19, we're still in hurricane uh, season. Anything that you need to know about planning and preparing for the storm season is in there as well. And a lot of information on a lot of different uh, programs that we have up and running now in the city of Tampa. So um, please visit tampagov.net for all the information that, that you may want and some information that you may not want, but you'll find very, very interesting. All right, we have a full slate of guests today, as you can see. So instead of reading everybody's biography, because uh, then the program would be over by the time I finished with all of your accomplishments, all right? So uh, I'll just introduce everybody by name and title, and then we'll get right into the conversations and you guys can, can uh, share all of the wonderful things that you're doing in our community. So we have Margie Nichols, a CPA uh, with the Altura Group. Monica Martino Angel, uh, Cure Kids Cancer Now Foundation. And I just rode uh, with some pediatric uh, uh, cancer patients on the water taxi on Saturday. We had a, we really had a great time, wonderful young kids. Uh, Diana Walker, who is the president of the Hispanic Professional Women's Association. Uh, Janice Burgos, the founder of Paint Network. And Mercedes Young, CEO of Vivid, consulting group. So welcome ladies, very excited that you're here and uh, sharing your time with us. All right, let's start with Diana. What is HPWA's mission? Well, first of all, thank you for the, for the invite. Um, HPWA has been in the Tampa Bay area for the past 30 years. So we're excited to be celebrating those 30 years. And our mission is to enhance the image of professional Hispanic women. And we do that by professional development, personal development, and giving back to our community through our mentoring and scholarship program. Excellent. That is wonderful. You need, uh, everybody needs those mentors. When I was in the police department, um, I was there for 31 years and, and my mentors were always men, which, you know, is fine, but it's always nice to see individuals successful that, you know, you, you really feel understand your life and your journey. Okay, uh, how, how is your organization celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month? Um, we're doing that through our mentorship program and just highlighting the amazing influential women that we have that are members of the organization that are giving back. Um, right now we're in the process of accepting applications for the mentorship program, which will kick off right when Hispanic Heritage Month celebration ends, which is October 15th. Um, so if you know of any high school seniors or any college students, um, definitely send them our way. <laughs> okay, good. Yes, we have a lot of um, programs in the high schools, and so that's, that's wonderful. So how, tell us how the mentorship program works. How do you match, and then exactly how does that work out? Yeah, so um, the mentees can access the application on our website, and then we try to pair them best as we can by industry, whatever their major may be. Um, and we kick off on October 15th, and that goes until April 15th. And then they also have the opportunity to apply for a scholarship at the end. So, for example, last year we had 22 mentees participate in the program. And out of those 22, 10 of them applied and received scholarships. Oh, wow. That's wonderful. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. If you So, give us the, is it on there? Give us uh, your website so that people can look on there and, and um, understand the organization and whatever it is, however they want to get in contact with you. Of course, they can visit our website at www.hpwatampa.org or they can follow us on our social media and our handle is HPWA Tampa. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, Diana. Thank you. All right, Janice, uh, in what ways does the Paint Network differ from othering, other networking events for minority women or just women in general. Uh, thank you again for having me, Mayor uh, Jane Caster. So the Paint Network is in, uh, interesting and unique in the fact that we really hone in and focus on three parts of um, an entrepreneur journey. So when women come to a Paint Network event, uh, they are learning, one, about resources, tools, and mentorships. So we invite subject matter experts to come and share their knowledge and share tools and resources to young minority women. Uh, the second is, is that we promote um, 
networking. And so we, am, we have a networking hour where all guests who attend the Paint Network events for free get to advertise their product or service. Um, sorry about that. Get to advertise their product or service with us. And so I think it's very special that people who attend the Paint Network events go with the intention of supporting another woman. Uh, and then we have the creative aspect. So all of our networking is done via affirmation painting. So we typically choose a subject like a, a golden crown to represent power, a lotus flower to represent peace. And so they're actually painting while they're networking and they're oh, okay. pairing um, these resources with one another. So it's very interesting when you see women um, use their creativity, and especially women who are not artists, you know, <laughs> They're in the zone, they're painting, they're network. And what I think it does is it really breaks down that intimidating, mm -hmm. intimidating layer that, you know, sometimes when you walk into a, a networking event, you have your name tag on and you're like, oh man, I have to go and introduce myself to 10 people. Yeah. Where here, you're actually, you know, you're painting. Um, people are going with the intent to support you, to buy from you. Um, and I think that's really special. And I think it's really unique. That is, that's, um, that was very interesting. I was just, that was one of the questions I was gonna ask was where you came up with that name. That is, uh, that's very exciting. All right, so how can we bridge the gap in utilizing current tools and resources such as funding uh, to Hispanic women that may not know these resources exist? So um, I primarily work with women, uh, young minority women ages 21 to roughly 27, 28. And so what I found here is that a lot of these women do not know about the tools and resources available to them. I think Tampa Bay does an, an amazing job and, and has women such as Diana who operate and work programs specifically for, you know, women of color and, and Hispanic women in the community. And so what I try to do is I try to bring on mentors, subject matter experts, people like Diana to attend my events, to be able to kind of bridge that gap between a, a beginner's level entrepreneur where it's kind of the formation of the dream. So a lot of the women who attend my events have either just started or just have a dream. And they're looking for a community who are going to help them be inspired. They're mm -hmm. going to help them connect with other like-minded women to say, hey, I'm going to hold your hand every step of the way. And these are the doors that I plan to open for you. And I think that that's really special because there are so many Latinas and in, in Hispanics in general who don't have that type of mentorships, who don't have fathers and mothers who already own businesses or who have already been presidents of Fortune 500 companies. So mm -hmm. they're looking for someone to kind of hold their hand and say, I'm going to lead you to this next level. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that the closer we can get to bridging those gaps, um, the more opportunities we can make for young women of color. Yes, without a doubt. Oh my gosh, you, you just said it perfectly. That is, and you know, to have somebody who has been through that, as you say, they've walked that path before and, and they can assist in helping you not make the same mistakes that they made. Because uh, last week uh, there was an entrepreneur on, on the show and, and we focused a lot on how much you learn from your mistakes. You learn so much more from mistakes than you do from success and then how you can apply that. And so to have somebody that, that has already gone as a mentor that has already gone through that, that's incredibly important. And then also for women in general, you know, quite often uh, women just don't have that confidence in their ability. You know, this, I always joke about this study that says if a particular job um, entails five skills, men will have one or two and apply for it and women will get six or seven and say, I'm still not ready. So, you know, that's, that's just sort of, we need to build that confidence among ourselves and then also help, uh, you know, help build those, those businesses and that creativity to inspire that uh, through mentoring. So that, that's, that's wonderful. And then if you get to throw in painting, it's, 
Well, I, I'm thank you, Mayor Jane um, Caster, for bringing up that point. I actually wanted to touch on that because even with a lot of the women who attend my events, even if they do know of organizations, they count themselves out. And that's really important that we understand that, that it's not just about shoving, you know, a piece of paper in front of them. It's not just about, oh, well, haven't you looked at the Tampa Bay website? Because yeah. it's not that. They see it or they'll hear about it, but you know what? They don't think they qualify right. or they don't think their idea is good enough. And mm -hmm. that is the specific gap that I'm looking to bridge in bringing on people who are going to take their ideas to the next level and to say, you you do, um, you know, deserve a seat at the table. You do qualify for these resources. And Amen. so, you know, the gap between myself and then again, Diana, who does so many amazing things, they are often surprised when they learn that they do qualify and they can mm -hmm. apply for these types of assistance and resources. Yes, mm -hmm. without a doubt. That is absolutely wonderful. All right, Margie, what's the first thing you would advise a woman to do when becoming an entrepreneur? Thank you for having me here today. I really appreciate it. I'm amongst strong women, so I'm very excited to be able to speak with them about this. Um, the first advice I would have uh, would be to have the right mindset. Um, you have to know that you're a business owner. There's responsibilities that comes with that. Um, and the way that you can get all that done is having a great support system. Um, I personally have belonged to HPWA. Um, I am uh, a member there, I'm a past president as well. And um, I definitely listen to videos. Uh, we need that conference. We need to be reminded every single moment of what we can do. And it's very important to have that. I've, I've also recommend mastermind uh, workshops um, and then treating your business as a business. That's what it is. It's it's mm -hmm. if you treat something as a hobby and don't take it seriously, I don't care how big or small this business is. Um, that's what you're going to have a hobby. Mm -hmm. So a respect to what you're doing um, to be able to tell yourself um, a great job you're doing. We lack that um, achievement part that uh, when you want to celebrate things that you have done, your accomplishments, we take them for granted a lot. We feel like, nah, that's not good enough. We can right. do more. And yes, we can do more, but all these little steps is what gets us to that other level. And we definitely have to recognize that. So the right mindset and great support system it's, it's one of the first things I would love for someone to um, take, in, take it to heart and work for building their business. That's great. And, and what, tell us, give us a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey and really what that experience has taught you. Clearly it's taught you to take it very seriously and, and put, you know, you're all into it, but tell us a little bit about that journey. Well, um, one of the most important parts that I've learned is um, the financial part. Now, I am a CPA. I would deal with um, accounting, taxes. Um, I'm a numbers person. I'm, I'm the opposite of uh, Dianese because um, you ask me what my favorite color is. I'll, I'll start thinking about it. I can't come up with a favorite color, but yet you bring me a percentage. You know, let me calculate something, and I'm, I'm in my world, which I love what I do. So, um, I definitely, uh, the financial part is so important to me. I, I feel like it is, it allows me to make choices. So what I bring here to my clients and to other women that I, I speak to um, is the fact that you have to understand what these um, finances mean on the personal side as much as to the business side on both, on both areas. Um, you have to uh, be able to know where you stand that way you can make good choices, business decisions and personal decisions. Um, you're not stuck anywhere. If you can feel confidence in your financial world and you feel um, more assertive in everything you do. So I definitely feel that um, as clients, I have clients that I teach about financials. Um, I also bring it to myself as a business owner. So I definitely have looked a lot into um, sharing that with other women. I even developed a financial coaching specifically for women because I really feel that we need yeah. that background to get us to where we want to be. Mm -hmm. 
And you know, so many people have a great idea. And I said a, a great idea or product or initiative is only a part of the like equation. The moment, moment. It's in the successful implementation that you find success. But you think about that, you know, it, you you may not, you may be a creative person and not necessarily the numbers person, but if you aren't paying attention to your your financial health, you may not survive. You know, you could have been a very successful business person and you may not survive. And so that I believe is a lot of the, um, the, the a, a, a share, a big share of the difficulty and sometimes the failure of small businesses because you are everything. You know, you are the CPA, you are the CEO, you are the tech person, you are, you're wearing every single hat and you have to, you have to pay attention to every area of that in order to be successful. So what do you think are some of the, the hurdles or the roadblocks that Hispanic women specifically encounter in the entrepreneurial world or even in the business world? Well, um, as a Latina, we definitely know what we want. We really go for what we have in mind and we focus so much. And you definitely touch on that because what we want is everything perfect. We know exactly how we want it, but we have to recognize that there are things we can't do it all because we will feel overwhelmed, we'll lose our focus. So we have to recognize how to let go of certain areas that can be either outsourced or someone else can do a little bit different than what we would want it to be. Um, but sometimes we get stuck on that and then we want to do it all. We end up doing it and I don't think we achieve our final goal. So we need to learn how to delegate that way we don't become burned out and, um, and know that in some areas, the 100% is not a necessity. So choose your battles. Which ones are you willing to say, all right, someone else can do well, almost to where I want it to be, but still a good work as opposed to trying to do everything. And I think that's our biggest mm -hmm. hurdle ourselves, trying to control everything. But uh, learning how to let go, I think is gonna give you a better journey and help you uh, enjoy this moment because these are decisions that we make. These are, this is something we have our own. And nobody said that entrepreneurship was going to be easy. It is not actually. It's just that we get to do it the way we want to and, and bring whatever message we have and our mission and our passion into what we do. So that's that's where it is ourselves. We have to learn how to how to let go. That is excellent advice because it is it's it's oftentimes it's very difficult to delegate because no one can do it as well as you can do it. But you have to, you know, you have to make those decisions. Um, and an effective delegator quite often is successful in business. And it doesn't mean that you give it away that task and it and it's it's done. You have to ensure it's done appropriately. But you do have to, and then that's a way to empower future generations and have other individuals uh, learn as well. And that's a piece of advice that I have always given is is um, expose yourself, take take these opportunities, take advantage of any opportunity that is presented to you. And when you, even if you're, you're joining HPWA, you know, run for one of the committees, run for presidency, take Absolutely. those leadership roles. And then also whatever company that you may work in before you break out on your own, learn every single role that there is to learn in there. Absolutely. So I think that's very important. It's just, you know, you have to, throw yourself out there. And uh, again, you learn more from quite often from mistakes than you do from successes. Mm -hmm. All right, Monica, tell us why you started the uh, Cure Kids Cancer Now Foundation and what the mission is. Sure, thank you. So first of all, thank you for saying it properly. Um, I know it's a bit of a mouthful, but we figured we'd put the mission right in the name. So our goal is to cure kids cancer now, right now, and give you things that you can do right now. It is a problem that obviously we all know exists. There's 50,000 kids in treatment in this country alone for cancer right now. 250 kids are going to die every single day. 
from childhood cancer or its treatment. So oftentimes people want to do something to help, right? But it's, what can I do? Oh, I don't know how to help or something like that. So we decided we would give you options of things you can do right now. So that's why we, we named it that way, Cure Kids Cancer Now. Our primary goal is to fund the deadliest forms of childhood cancer, and those are the brain cancers that affect babies. Oh, oh I didn't know that. Oh, I like, that's okay. I've got, uh, if Dessa, the office dog, was in here every once in a while, I just get like thrown. So she just runs and does like these linebacker blocks on me. So we love dogs around here. Okay, uh, people don't think of a nonprofit founder as an entrepreneur. But, you know, it's a startup just like any other startup, right? So how has COVID brought about challenges in fundraising? And I know I've done a lot of virtual fundraisers, so you have to be very creative. Indeed you do. And I think Margie hit the nail on the head of having to be all things to all people, right? So certainly in starting the foundation, it was very much, how do you do build a website? Who do you call for this? And how do you, um, and thankfully we were surrounded by a lot of people. And I think that is one of the biggest benefits of being Cuban Sicilian is that we have people for days and people who show up and people who will help and volunteer their time and, and those kinds of things. One of the other things that my both my parents really taught me was build the well before you're thirsty. So in yeah. this moment, it's not as challenging to go and ask for funds or things like that because those those relationships have already been built, that reputation's already been mm -hmm. built. And so it is a bit harder because of the things that we can't do, but those relationships are still there. And I think um, one thing that COVID has done has really inspired people to break down silos and barriers. And that's something we've been trying to do for years now and really push these things through. So we partner with other foundations to accomplish our goals. We are not worried about having our name on anything. We just want to cure kids cancer now. So now that we're seeing kind of this progress that's being made with COVID, people are seeing that really it is possible to actually do these things that sometimes felt impossible or we were convinced were impossible. So let's not bother doing it. You know, we have these horrible numbers of COVID. We're not sitting down as a country and just saying, never mind, we're done here. We're fighting back and we're doing everything that we can to fight back. And so our foundation and many others are doing exactly that. Yes. And doing it very, very creatively. Mm -hmm. So, um, So what, tell us that this is Hispanic Heritage Month. So it's a big month for you and your foundation as well. So talk about why this is a really big month for you. Sure. So um, I would certainly be remiss if I didn't bring it up that September is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. It's really Childhood Cancer Action Month. So you can take some actions and certainly you can check out our website if you want to learn some ways that you can do that. But it really is important for us to ensure that people understand that this is a real problem that's continuing on. This is not something that was caused by, you know, moms feeding kids their Pop-Tarts or something. More often than not, childhood cancers are genetic. And that's where they come from. It was not because of anybody making a mistake. Unfortunately, though, the treatments that are available for children are almost exclusively adult treatments that have been watered down for kids. That's just the truth of that. And for those of us who have kids, you know, you can't even give your, give your child an adult Tylenol, yeah. but we can give them adult chemotherapy and just dose it down. But their little bodies aren't built for that. So during the month of S September in particular, we wear gold, we talk about our kids, we highlight their journeys, regardless of how those journeys may have ended or if they're still going, we highlight those children and their bravery and we fight on their behalf. Oh, that's wonderful. That is wonderful. We lit our city hall up. So I think I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Since funding the deadliest forms of childhood cancer is your top priority, is there a difference for survival in Hispanic children? Unfortunately, yes. So there had been studies done for a while that um, basically claimed that the reason why children of color and Hispanic children were dying more frequently was because of the kinds of cancer that they were getting. That's been debunked now. That's just not true. Even if we look at the most survivable forms of childhood cancer, children of color and Hispanic children are dying at a higher rate. And that is unacceptable. So one of the things that we do when we are talking to Congress is we try to address those disparities as best we can and ensure that that just does not remain true. Oh, no kidding. Oh my gosh, that's um, that just breaks my heart. I, yes. I, I, I appreciate, thank you for all that you do and we should all do everything we can to uh, stomp out cancer right now, but specifically uh, for young children too. So, and they're so, 
resilient. So one of the little boys I spent Saturday with was Ryan and he was seven. I was talking to his parents and his dad says, you know, all of his friends and coworkers always say, how's Ryan? He goes, Ryan's a seven year old. He's fine. You know, look at him, his energy and everything. He goes, and then when they ask me how I'm doing, he goes, I have to walk away. So kids are so strong. And, um, yes. but still, you know, just the, the um, unfairness of it all really is, is what is so striking. All right, Mercedes Young, thank hey. you for joining. We got you here. So tell us yeah. about your consulting group. That, so I, I ran a, uh, and Margie, you may want to um, uh, like plug your ears right now because my kids lost me in math in like fourth grade. But I started my own consulting business when I retired as a police officer. And uh, that's tough, you know, going yes. out there on your own. So tell us about your consulting business, what the focus is, and really, you know, just how, how you've been doing. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. And I tell you that I travel literally around the world. I just got back from Africa in the Middle East, and you are the best mayor. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, thank you, you know. By far because you are reachable i just just for the because this is girls i uh was work i was just in the streets um sending um just giving away uh hand sanitizers and mask two weeks ago in now uh, in san pete because the chief of police over there know me like mercedes we're going to be doing this in the streets can you donate something i say i'll come and, and i'll be and literally i was in the streets with a suit a black suit Ooh. and uh oh i don't know how you do it because I've seen you with a three-piece suit and a heat with dirt and and you just keep it so cool and the yeah. drip of soap was going on the back of my in my back yeah, and kept going back. down and I'm like oh Jesus they're gonna think I'm being on myself <laughs> it was horrible That's but you hilarious. I see you partying yeah. I see you out there everywhere and I will tell Everybody, you this we've been everywhere I mentioned your name everywhere I went and I will tell you why because mayors were like trying to reach God it was they were untouchable people but you are like the people's people so okay. I do appreciate who you are really from the core I well, don't know how much you get paid but I hope it's enough <laughs> I tell you that never never enough that's why you don't do it for the pay you do Jeez, it you got to do it because it's your call and your passion right. but uh, what we do in vivid consulting group and thank you for the opportunity because i'm going to share some of the things that some of us probably go through i just launched my first book three weeks ago and you can find it on amazon prosperity through service and the reason why I felt the urgency to write this book was that within me in five weeks was because in Vivid Consulting Group, we started providing services in civil engineering, land surveying and safety supply. And the focus was always land surveying and civil engineering, which you guys know that in construction, it's tough to compete with the big companies, your HNTBs, you know, your Jacobs. But more than anything, as a woman, who doesn't have the licenses because I'm not an engineer nor PSM, but I went for it because I realized that they were lacking the, the building, the relationships to get the contracts and the marketing and business development. And that's my niche. I've been doing it for years. So with that said, it, it was my baby, just like probably everybody here to you is your city to the rest of the ladies here that I know all of them. Yay! <laughs> it's our babies. We carry it dearly. We sleep with it. We wake up just like a baby. It, it, that's what we do. And always hoping that one day it can change its own clothes, right? <laughs> right. So, um, and I may, I gave myself a goal. I say, if I get to four years and I'm not making the money that I wanted to make, uh, I'm going to look else. I'm going to do something else. I'm going to have to pivot. Little did I know that the moment came with the COVID-19. And I was already thinking around January, I really need to pivot, but I've always been in service in organizations. You all know that I'm in five national organizations, but I, I don't pay membership. I'm in the boards. I mean, I always want to make sure that I am at the decision making table. You know, I wanted to be the ears for the other people that don't get to be at the table. So I stand for them. That's why I'm on these organizations because I know what's going on in my city, in my country, and I can go ahead and be that voice. And then on top of that, I'm bilingual, so I can not actually trilingual because my crazy voice is better. It's the best <laughs> voice. That's that's the real Nobody voice. Nobody wants to hear that one. <laughs> right? <laughs> but anyway, so with that said, I went through so much 
learning the ropes and falling and getting up and how do you get the certification and who's the right people to talk to and how do I protect myself? And I will tell you guys that the last one, how do I protect myself, cost me to write my book. I lost a $3 million contract that I worked for for two years in one email from the right person to the wrong group. And if I would have had a letter of intent, as simple as a letter of intent, that would have never taken place. But because of the associations where I served, they all stood up for me and I was compensated a settlement because I tell them I'm not going to let it go because it wasn't for me. It was for Yanis, for Monica. Hey, lady, how are you? <laughs> My Brazilian representation. And for Margie, it was for all of us. I told them this is going to be the last time that you are going to do this to a woman-owned company. If you don't ever do it again, I want to make sure you remember me. And I made sure of that. So I wrote this book that I wanted to be like a manual where people can go, where do I do this? How do I do my, my taxes? How do I do all of these things? And it's really being part of associations, mm -hmm. being part of your city. I cannot tell you that everybody here in the city of Tampa and Hillsborough County has been part of my business. Being Even the name of my company actually that's how i made diana when she was working with prospera at the time prospera was another name at the time and they the one who gave me the grant to get the name for my company all of those things that we need to to create our organization are there but if you just come up with this great idea i get up in the morning who do you bump bump into who do you talk to and then on top of that being a woman and then being always i can tell you in the last three months i need a girlfriend shower i've been with nothing <laughs> but men's and dudes and hairy people and i just want to be with women i'm telling you the truth it is like if somebody besides me can show up with a flower bomb cologne you know yeah. and and it has been really and i if it wasn't because of my last four years of really being tough I stood in my ground knowing I'm going to negotiate this contract and you're going to deal not with a woman, not with a Hispanic with an accent, not with a black chick. You're going to deal with a professional. That's who you are working with. And I was able to stand on my ground because I know that it's not just vivid consulting group. Mm -hmm. I represent every woman that would ever come and stand there and say, you know what, women, we have to respect them when they are at the table. They are just as professional than anybody that wear bridges. Mm -hmm. It's just Amen. as simple as that. So yep. that has been really my motivation um, to, to write this book. So go get it and, and, and pass it on. It's a manual where to go. And I put all the websites and don't, and I even put in there, you don't have to pay for anything, get it all for free. So I'm going to build some haters there. I know that, but I'm okay. There you go. Well, that's excellent. And that what excellent advice as well. You know, that's the beauty of diversity. That's what I, I would always tell everyone at the police department in the city too, that we are all a sum total of our life experiences and every one of us up here have had different life experiences and you need those around the table when decisions are being made but we also have to count on each other and help each other out to be able to as many of you said open up those doors so somebody can walk through that for me when i was 17 somebody took a chance on me and gave me an athletic scholarship that turned into a college education. And that has opened every door for me throughout my life. And so I made a promise that I'd spend the rest of my life opening the door for others. And so thank you all so much for everything that you do for not only for our community, but to help out, to pay it forward in some form or fashion. So I thank each and every one of you for all that you do, Mercedes, I can't wait to read that book. And you know, I'm always available for that. Uh, that wait a minute, wait meeting. a minute. You didn't say nothing about dancing. My birthday party's coming oh, next year. Yeah. So just, just, just practice yeah. on your moves, guys. Yeah, she can dance. She's seen me, <laughs> so she's seen me. I can do a little bit of the salsa, but it ain't pretty. So I'll have to. I'll stick with my day job of being the mayor. Oh, right? Being the mayor, a little, city bit, mayor. little bit better at that. But anyway, we're going to close up now. I can't thank you all enough. I have to remind everyone, critically important, and I would welcome each panelist's um, assistance on this, fill out the census. Incredibly yes. important. It determines what the funding is for our community. More importantly, it determines 
what voice we have in Washington, D.C. So filling out the census, I tell everybody it took me five minutes to fill it out, and I am probably the most technologically challenged person walking the earth, and also voting, the importance of voting. This election cycle, more than any in my 60 years on earth, is incredibly important uh, that individuals are voting. And if you can all text a, uh, Tampa Ready to 888-777 or Tampa Lista to 888-777, you can get uh, messages from the city in English and in Spanish about an array of things uh, dealing with COVID-19, with the storms, uh, anything that, that's uh, going on in our community. So I thank each and every one of you once again for what you do. I am so inspired and impressed and honored that you spent um, uh, this little bit of time uh, with me today. And I do thank you all for everything you do. And Monica, uh, anything that I can do to help, you know, whatever it is I can do to help stomp out cancer, I am, I am all over that as well. So thank you, thank you all very much. And to our viewers, remember, what do you do? Stay calm, stay safe. Most importantly, stay kind. You guys all take care. Thanks. God bless. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.